um, first slide, if you can call it a slide. Um, secondly, I want to say that um, uh, I also, there's nothing very original about what I have to say. My career for the last 20 years, my job has been to listen as carefully as I can, try to understand uh, the situation, and then report back. So the content of this presentation really comes from my colleagues, my friends, uh, my collaborators, and my informants, my neighbors, uh, during the times that I have lived in and visited Indonesia. And many of you are in the room right now, so uh, this is really, I listen and I report back. The one thing that I add is I add a framework, a theoretical framework, and a perspective that comes from outside of Indonesia. And I'm happy to report, even though I've been away for many, many years, this is my first trip back to Indonesia in seven years. Uh, but during that time, I've been working hard doing research on Latin America. And I think there are many lessons from Latin America that are very applicable to Indonesia. I think Indonesia is ready uh, to to turn things around the way Latin American cities have turned things around. So the title of my talk is something like, and I don't remember what I said to the committee, but is uh, Indonesian architecture in the role of urban transformation in the 21st century, or uh, as I am theorizing it as a historian and a theorist, uh, I am developing the idea that the 21st century is the second age of modernity. So the second modernity. And this is an idea that comes out of uh, German and con other European continental sociology. So uh, the question I'm asking myself is, how does this perspective of a second age of modernity help us understand what is happening already in Indonesian cities? And what could happen? How can we take control of it and make it do more for the people of Indonesia? So that's the basic question. And in the process, I come back to the, the set of ideas that were taught to me by my collaborators first in, in Yogyakarta at UGM, back starting in 1991 when I first arrived here uh, and came to study, I came with a three-month grant to study the Kraton Solo, Kraton Surakarta. And uh, my three-month stay stretched and then stretched and stretched, and so I was here for four years. Um, and uh, it was one of the most productive and important periods of my life, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, push the wrong button. Back here. So um, this idea of cultural construction, uh, it became very clear when I arrived that the Kraton Surakarta was not a dead monument. It was a living monument. Uh, I was very surprised that there was a palace in Solo. I didn't know that before I came. And then I said, oh, I'll go visit it. I was assuming it was like colonial, uh, I was assuming it was a dead monument. Uh, and so I went in and I said, hi, uh, who are you? And he said, I'm a prince. And this prince became my collaborator and, <clears throat> and good friend. I'm still texting him today. Um, and I said, a prince? You're kidding, right? He said, no. Um, who's the king? He said, and so I thought he was kidding. But there was, it turns out, there's a king. And there still is a king. And it turns out that there are ceremonies that are performed on a regular basis. And if we can turn off these lights, we can see it a little better. This photo could be from the 17th century or the 19th century, or it could be from when it was. This photo was taken in the 90s. And these, these rituals are continue to be performed, but not in the style of colonial Williamsburg. Um, thank you. Uh, for not turning it into that kind of tourist attraction. It continues to be practiced 
in the way that the Vatican in Rome continues to hold masses. This is a religious, philosophical, cultural institution. It still has meaning to the people of Indonesia, or at least to the Javanese. And it deserves, um, as long as people, as long as this palace is meaningful, it deserves to continue um, in, a, in a way similar, not the same, but it, it evolves, but continues its fundamental role. And its fundamental role, uh, I learned, was not just a place for the king, not just a location, not just a facility. The function of the kraton was to maintain and restore the balance between heaven and earth. And the architecture is the key to that. Um, let's face it, the architecture is not so luxurious and grand. Uh, it's pretty simple. The interesting thing about the Kraton Solo and the Kraton Jogja is that it continues to be an instrument of transformation. And so this is the first place where I learned about architecture, not just as a passive reflection of culture, but architecture as an active tool to transform society. So when there is a natural disaster, um, when there's a natural disaster in Indonesia, um, I'm pushing on the button clearly. Um, but when there's a natural disaster, um, there, are, there needs to be rituals performed. And before we restored uh, the central plaza for the Aga Khan Award in 1995, we had to perform the same rituals because it does no good to maintain the buildings. And in the process of maintaining the buildings, uh, degrading the social, cultural function of the building. And so I think we were the first outside group that came in uh, that actually uh, required that all of the religious practices be, um, be observed um, and everything. And so this, um, the Kraton continues to be an instrument for controlling change. Uh, there's been a decision recently to uh, make it more of an amusement park atmosphere, which is unfortunate. But in the recent struggle over ascendancy to the throne of Paco Buono Katiga Blas, uh, the, the occupant of the Kraton, who is continuing to perform the role as Sinun, unbroken, had a distinct advantage. And so uh, the recent reconciliation two weeks ago between the uh, rival factions was resolved to a large extent based on who was occupying the center of the space of the palace. And so, um, and this will continue on into the future. And so many of these issues have been brought up uh, yesterday and today already, that heritage conservation is not a museum project. It's not just a museum project. It is about what is important to us today. And I'm happy to report that uh, after World War II in the United States, we assumed that everything that came before is over and done with. And everything that comes after is new. It's a whole new world. And for years and decades, Indonesia has been playing a very dangerous game of saying, maybe it's like that here. Everything that came before is, is old. It's kuno. It's obsolete. It's time to move on, look forward, erase the past. And I'm happy to say I think we've dodged that bullet to a large extent, except for uh, cars, other than the car thing which that's the next thing to uh, overcome. Uh, except for the car thing, I think Indonesia has survived and is ready to step forward with uh, its past, its, its gloriously rich past intact. And I think that's what I take from the presentations that deal with heritage conservation, is heritage conservation is about the future. Now, uh, You'll notice the way I'm talking here, the most important thing about it is that buildings are not just passive reflections of values and culture and meaning of, to a society. Buildings are also an instrument for reproducing those values or for extending those values 
and meanings. And those lessons from the Kraton solo of how the, the Kraton solo has always been an instrument of restoring the balance between heaven and earth and also restoring the, the balance within society between the wealthy and the poor. Uh, and it's an ordering device, so it's an instrument of order. Cities are that way too. And this, um, this relationship, it's not cause and effect, but it's a mutually, uh, it's a cycle. The city influences society, and society influences the city. And this is um, beautifully illustrated by several of the presentations, especially Pat Yorty's yesterday, about social-spatial connections. Now, as soon as we move away from the trap of cause and effect, it opens us up to this mutual relationship. It's not one direction or the other. It's a cyclical thing. And that's when you get into the idea of reflexivity. Reflexivity is an is a attribute of systems that operate in cycles back and forth. How much time do I have? How much, how much time is that? Sorry? So far, how much time did I take? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. I'm on track. And I've written about this in, um, in terms of architecture outside of Indonesia, uh, published in the Delft uh, Journal that was uh, mentioned. But I'm always keeping in mind uh, the Ecomos uh, book of Indonesian heritage uh, that was published in 1996, I think. Uh, that many, I think some people who contributed are, are in the audience. Uh, but the thing that, uh, I was asked to uh, write the introduction to the Ecomos book on Indonesian heritage. And uh, again, most of what I was able to write in that introduction came from reading uh, the contributions of that volume. And what struck me was to the extent that Indonesia is a superpower of continuous living heritage that these cultures are not dead. They continue to the present and continue to play an important role in the construction of meaning of life. What does life mean to the Indonesian people? To a large extent, it means more than Indomart or the cell phone or the motorbike. Uh, it means there's always a, a, a richness to the meaning of life uh, available once you get bored uh, punching the buttons on your cell phone which is a good thing to have, by the way. Uh, Sukarno understood this. Sukarno's job, the first uh, political leader in Indonesia to be an architect, um, Sukarno understood the role of the physical space of the city in transforming society. And he used, he focused on the form of the city and what its meanings are. He created in a completely modern vocabulary uh, the linga nyoni of Hindu Javanese cosmology. And he um, used it to establish the monas as the paku buono, as the center of the earth, as the puser. Uh, and so, uh, and he, but he saw no difference. He, he was not conflicted. This, his project of reconstruction of, of Jakarta was a political project. The physical space will transform the people. And so he didn't just embed the linga yoni in the physical fabric of Jakarta. He also brought in samangi, the clover leaf, the symbol of the 20th century modernism, uh, to give people hope for the future. And then Suharto, uh, whether he was probably less conscious of it as a non-architect, but he did it too. His job was to start out as a military strongman, as a general with strong military control over Indonesia, and to evolve into the benevolent dictator who uh, became the father of development. So the transformation of the national project from keeping order in a military using the threat of violence uh, and the, the rifle and the tank and to move that to the aspiration and the hope of modernization of development moving forward. And so he did that. And he gave the people of Indonesia um, the dignity uh, of becoming global partners. They became 
Indonesia is now a strong global player on the stage. And this helped everyone in Indonesia to feel a sense of pride and dignity. Am I right? There's a, there's a lot of pride in this. Um, but it came at a cost. And it's left to the following generations to strike a more uh, just balance in that. And I think a lot of what has been said even today is about striking a better balance. Um, because there is a symbiotic relationship. This is not just conflict. You can't have the mega project unless you have the informal settlements. The informal settlements and the mega project, and this is not an informal settlement, uh, as you know, but um, I get away with showing this in the West, but I know I can't speak about it that way here. You know better. Um, but the informal settlements are a part of the global city. Uh, every city in the world has informal settlements that are symbiotically related. You can't have one without the other. Um, so in the center of Jakarta, the symbols of the skyscraper were very important to the new order. Um, just as important outside of the city centers, the new real estate developments, um, the agraria laws that were used to take the, the land from the, uh, from the Dutch plantations and give it back to the kampongs and the desas, the villages of Indonesia, that very same law was used in the new order to take the land from the villagers and give it to the developers so that they could pursue the national cause of development here manifested as the development of luxury golf communities for the very wealthiest Indonesians. And not for them to live in. Some very wealthy Indonesians live in these towns. But the main purpose or the main function it is currently performing is as investment property. The mortgage subsidy and the building of these towns has provided an excellent investment vehicle to preserve and extend the wealth of the wealthiest 5% or 1% of Indonesia. Uh, in the meantime, the Photoshop campaign materials translated almost directly into Photoshop uh, physical environments that have been extremely uh, destructive of the landscape, where you have a vast area of the uh, surrounding areas of Jabodetabek that are now consumed by these real estate developments, constantly displacing uh, the people um, and building walls that disconnect them from their social economic opportunities. The Satu Tiga the 136, very progressive, unprecedented in the world, I think, very progressive, forward-looking, uh, just uh, development law, were basically ignored simply by mentioning social jealousy which um, Indonesia has a long history of, um, of managing quite well. And it's very disappointing that the government and the developers and academia in general in Indonesia have let them get away with abandoning 136. Uh, it still is an excellent idea. Uh, it's not in the past. It doesn't, it shouldn't be 123. It should be 136, and it should be defended. Um, it's three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Thank you. And, but the biggest single thing that during the Suharto era, uh, the, the most dramatic thing was the way people move around the city. It turns out that our understanding of the world comes disproportionately from our experience in urban space. And so the transformation of the social spatial order of our cities, including Malioboro, the domination of these private space packaged in a steel and metal box uh, that on wheels that rolls through our neighborhoods in Indonesia. Uh, this was the biggest transformation and the single most destructive force, and it shows no, no signs of stopping. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the key entry point. Once you understand these principles, and you look around the world, you realize the importance of the political office of the mayor, or the governor in the case of Jakarta. The mayor is the one who can make the difference. And everyone thinks that the most important thing that happened in Bilbao was the Guggenheim Museum. If you look at it just a little bit, you very quickly realize that the museum was the cherry on top 
of 30 years of transformation. The building did not transform Bilbao. Bilbao was transformed by changing the transportation system, the economic system, the investment in education, the public space, and then at the very last end, they put the Guggenheim Museum as the symbol of that transformation. A similar thing, if you look at Latin America, this is my friend Sergio Fajardo. He's the mayor. He was the mayor of Medellin, Colombia. If you've heard of Medellin, Colombia, it's because it was the murder capital of the world up until the 90s. Um, and you could look at the social transformation of Medellin and say, well, of course it's transformed. They did what Salalum II wants to do. They built a metro cable car, and they, built, they did what Bill Bao did. They built a monumental building. But that is not the story. The story is that they were going to do a metro cable uh, to extend the mass transit system, but they were going to give it to the wealthiest people of Medellin. They were going to build a library in a park, uh, but they were going to do it in the center of town for the wealthiest citizens of Medellin. When Sergio Fajardo became mayor, he said, I'm not going to steal any more money. And all of a sudden, the money that had been stolen was $700 million US. So all of a sudden, he and his team had $700 million to do something. So they built the metro cable. They built the library in the park. But they didn't build it in the center for the richest people. They broke all the rules of being a mayor. Everyone knows that when you're a mayor, you build something spectacular for, just as was just said, for the wealthiest people. No. They put pins in the map where all the bodies were found from the drug wars. And they located the spot that had the most bodies. This is where the most dead bodies were found in Medellin. They purchased the land from the people who were saying, please get me out of here before they kill me. Uh, and that's where they built. So they gave the, this is a world class piece of architecture. They gave the best architecture money could buy and that talent could provide. And they built it in the poorest community with a beautiful park, it transformed the entire neighborhood, and they built the metro cable car to that neighborhood. It's not for tourists, it's for the people. But guess who comes here, and this is the hottest tourist attraction in Latin America. Not because they built a tourist attraction, it's the hottest tourist attraction in Latin America because they built it for the people who live there. Uh, Sergio Fajardo came to Boston and he gave an impassioned speech and he told us why he did this. He also told us that uh, he didn't build just one of these, he built five of these. And this is not all he did. He built uh, uh, 50 new schools for the children and renovated 120 schools for the children. This was not an architecture project. This was a social transformation project that was made credible and believable because there was a physical transformation. He said, I'm going to make Medellin the most educated center in the world, and the most, ed most educated city in Colombia. And everyone's going to think of Medellin people as being smart. And so everyone said, oh, right, sure, we've heard that before. And he said, no, no, I mean it. Look. And he pointed at his projects, and they said, oh, I believe it. This is the murder rate in Medellin. It was the highest in Colombia. And it dropped below the other cities because of this transformation. And he didn't change the housing. So just to the last point is what mayors can do. This is Joko Wee's project, the tree window in Solo. Uh, in Surabaya, you have an architect mayor, I understand, who is transforming Surabaya. Uh, and Joko Wee is now running for governor of Jakarta. It could be that the time has come um, that uh, instead of Poromoro uh, and instead of uh, Chili, Chiliwum, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is, um, this is not a public housing project from 1955. This is an actual proposal for the Chiliwum displacement project in Jakarta. And build flyovers, but don't let private automobiles use them. This could be uh, the extension of the, the Trans-Jakarta busway. Reject the ideas of JICA, sorry, but uh, JICA is very flexible. Uh, if, if you ask JICA what, they, what should be done, they'll say, oh, you need a ring road, you need a flyover. 
uh, and we'll lend you the money. We'll be very generous in offering you all the debt you want to help you allow 10% uh, uh, or 15% of the population to get around more easily, but everyone else will suffer. Everyone knows elsewhere in the world that flyovers and expansions of roadways increases the traffic jams. It doesn't make sense, but the data has been in for 40 years. We know this with absolute uh, certainty. More flyovers, more traffic jams. <laughs> um, and just to finish, uh, Abdul Malik Simon is uh, a, a, a scholar who has recently been attracted to looking at Indonesia's and Jakarta's especially uh, strategies for transformation from the bottom up. And uh, I think this is this is the key. This is where the future is. Um, I think that in the 1960s, a crucial decision was made not to bulldoze the kampung in Jakarta, but instead to improve the kampung in Jakarta. That was a brilliant idea then. It is a brilliant idea today. The future of Indonesia is in the kampungs, and they need to be empowered to transform the kampungs, and I think the mayors are the ones to do it. Thank you very much.